Hi, Michael. It's great to be with you again. Folks uh, who haven't seen our previous interviews, I'm uh, joined by Michael uh, Aaron Kamins today, um, who I've described in the past as a metaphysical poet, uh, someone whose poetry, I think, uh, forwards the spirit of Heidegger and also uh, epitomizes uh, an attempt to retrieve, I think, what was most innovative uh, and groundbreaking about modernity. Michael, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for that really cool introduction. <laughs> well, we're here to talk about your new book, which is fantastic, Uberman. Really, really enjoyed it. And why don't we jump in? Sure. Shoot. I thought a good place to start. There's a remarkable scene in the book when the protagonist, Dana Avalon, she's traveled back in time to the 1980s on a mission to change history. But one of her objectives is to insinuate herself into the life of a young Jason Reza Giorgiani, like as his tutor, but ultimately to steer the course of his life. And during that period of time, Dana is writing a book called Uberman. And at one point, a young Jason, I think seven years old, asks her, what this book is about that she's writing. And this leads to what I thought was an incredible scene because uh, she explains the premise of the book and in a way that a, a seven-year-old child could understand. And it's basically like a distillation of Prometheism, but put in a way that a child could understand. And I, I thought that there was something really powerful about that, that if you can, you know, some might argue that a concept is powerful and valid if you can break it down in a way that a child could understand. And one way that she does that is making references to pop culture, uh, Superman, Star Trek, uh, pop culture sci-fi that Jason was into. And essentially it's, it's a book about how we can develop superpowers like superheroes or supervillains to become more than human in the future. And the uh, convergent technologies that can allow humanity to do that. So I was wondering if you could treat us to a summary of that description <laughs> um, of that scene or of a description of that. Sure. With reference to the icons, the, you know, sci-fi. Yeah. It's a plot device that I used in Faustian Futurist, my first novel, to which this is a sequel of sorts, uh, where there is a book within the book uh, from which the book gets its title. So in Faustian Futurist, the protagonist, uh, protagonist Nikolai wrote this uh, manuscript, Faustian Futurism, from which the title Faustian Futurist comes. Uh, as you just summarized in Uberman, Dana Avalon has to find a way uh, having traveled back in time from the year 2112, she has to find a way to uh, articulate her project in the context of the technologies uh, and scientific knowledge base available in the 1980s. So, you know, she is drawing from early texts involving uh, uh, genetic engineering, nanotechnology, cybernetics, robotics and what I refer to as psionics here, or basically, uh, you know, science and technology based on parapsychology. And her primary mission in Uberman is actually to uh, redirect the course of history by preventing the collapse of the Soviet Union, but her secondary mission is to uh, basically alter the, the trajectory of my biography. So she's a future incarnation of me, the subsequent incarnation of me, and uh, part of her task is to basically um, restructure the course of events in my life. And so there is this scene, as you described, where she's trying to explain <clears throat> the project of Prometheism and specifically the thesis of Uberman to, you know, seven-year-old version of myself. And it becomes a context uh, for, you know, delving into a number of different um, uh, pop culture, um, icons, and uh, basically uh, mythologies 
that were birthed by America uh, in this zenith of modernity that was the 1980s. So for example, when she's trying to get across to him what genetic engineering is, uh, she reminds him, or rather she reminds a seven-year-old version of myself of Khan Noonien and Singh in Star Trek and you know these genetically engineered supermen who basically break away from the earth and uh, you know wind up trying to um, reassert their control after they're brought out of cryogenic suspension and so forth. And you know what was the best of the Star Trek films, I think, uh, by general consensus, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and also that episode Space Seed in the original series, uh, which has a, a fascinating reference to Lucifer at the conclusion of it. Um, so that's in terms of genetic engineering. And then, of course, in terms of uh, uh, robotics, you know, there's a whole um, discussion of Terminator and uh, Robocop and so forth. Um, and she has to explain, for example, that cybernetics isn't a question of cyborgs, it's a question of like uh, networked information processing systems and a kind of emergent artificial intelligence. And for that, she uses the example of Skynet in Terminator. Uh, because, you know, even in the original Terminator film from 84, you have that whole exchange between uh, the time traveler and Linda Hamilton's character where he's telling her how, you know, Skynet uh, basically re retaliated against the threat of having itself taken offline by initiating this global thermonuclear war. And so, um, you know, it's a variety of these examples. Uh, the one, of course, that's most relevant in terms of psionics is Ghostbusters, where um, you know Dana Avalon is explaining to uh, this young version of myself how there could be all kinds of technological gadgets developed on the basis of the kind of scientific knowledge that parapsychologists are seeking. And you know, I mean, this is what the Ghostbusters do. They're engineers, uh, innovators um, who are using this kind of uh, edge science of the soul in order to uh, engineer gadgetry that, you know, um, allows us to have a more Promethean control over uh, occulted uh, abilities and dimensions of, of, you know, human experience. Um, so that's uh, cybernetics, robotics, psionics. Is there, oh, and then, okay, so the most, the most difficult thing for her to, to get across to him is you know the the ethical core of the text Uberman, which isn't about how specific technological innovations in these various domains are going to converge to produce the technological singularity, but rather uh, in what way this challenges us to transform our ethos um, as a human community, uh, in what ways we're challenged to transcend and overcome mere humanity and to develop an ethical uh, fabric or, or fiber that um, is up to the uh, task of integrating these technologies and, and techniques. Uh, so there, there's a whole conversation about <clears throat> the Jedi Knights and superheroes. And, you know, it's interesting if you look back at the culture of the 1980s, how anti-democratic these myths are. Uh, like, I mean, the Justice League, who elected these people? Right. The, you know, who elected the Jedi Knights? It's fascinating how America, at the peak of its supposed advocacy for the spread of democracy around the world, was producing a kind of platonic Nietzschean mythos that was about guardianship of society by a spiritual elite. You know, people who were like uh, uh, the monk slash knight, you know, of the Middle Ages or a kind of, you know, kshatriya. Uh, in the old, uh, you know, ancient Aryan uh, system. Uh, so, of course, in a more mer meritocratic manner that you find in Plato's Republic, rather than anything that would be, you know, um, too closely connected to the Hindu caste system. But in any case, uh, she uses these examples, Dane Avalon does, of the Jedi Knights and the Justice League uh, to get across the idea that if we're to survive and then thrive on the other side of the technological singularity, we're going to need a kind of um, guardianship by people who have become more than merely human and ultimately with the purpose 
of fostering that superhumanity uh, within each and every member of you know the community that's been capable of integrating this kind of science and technology. Yeah, and it really put things in perspective for me too about your whole project. A quote from from that scene, which I just mentioned a moment ago, was it's about how we can develop superpowers like superheroes or supervillains to become more than human in the future. And then genetics, nanotechnics, cybernetics, robotics, and psionics. I'll explain what kinds of superpowers each of them could give us and how they can totally change the way that we live. And what I like about that too is the idea of the cyborg. And it's not that these technologies are separate from us, but as we make these technological innovations, they become part of us and they mutate humanity. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I, I think that's really cool that what this book is really about is about um, about how we can develop superpowers. And then you were also going into some of what the ethical implications of that could mean. Yeah, I mean, some of the ethical implications are utterly horrifying. Like, for example, uh, Dana Avalon uh, uses the um, uh, molecular reassemblers, the, uh, the basically the, um, what do they call those? Um, the replicators in Star Trek The Next Generation, like the food replicators and so forth. Uh, they use nanites to basically um, assemble, you know, any object, right? Uh, like a, like a uh, 3D printout, but using, you know, nanoscale components in order to basically take a feedstock and produce uh, any object that, uh, you know, has had its pattern stored in the computer system. She uses this example and also the example of transformers or robots that can shapeshift in order to uh, get across the danger of these kinds of technologies. Like, I mean, uh, you know, you could develop through a fusion of nanotechnology and shape-shifting robots, you could develop insect-sized drone assassins, you know, that would be like the size of a mosquito uh, and, you know, could uh, inject some kind of a poison into somebody's neck. And the thing is actually a robot. And the thing can even, you know, change shape and become a spider and uh, crawl away before you've, you know, been able to notice what, what the culprit was, you know, of this stealth assassination. So what all of this suggests is the need to shift to a society that is, uh, doesn't have a legal system based on retroactive prosecution. Uh, because a lot of these crimes, and here you have a, a, a dovetailing of uh, you know, nanotech and, and robotics with something like psionics, a lot of these crimes are, are potentially untraceable, right? I mean, if someone sends a, an insect drone uh, to assassinate you, you know, no one will ever ever be the wiser about how you met your demise. I mean, that is an untraceable crime. And uh, to use the euphemism from the 1980s, uh, it'll be as easy as buying parts from Radio Shack to put these things together, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years from now. OK, so uh, and, and in, in a similar manner, if as I suggest in this uh, part of Uberman that you're highlighting, if it becomes um, as easy as learning a martial art for you to cultivate adept psychokinetic abilities, well, I mean, anyone with a grudge against someone else could use that to give the person a stroke or a heart attack. It's been well demonstrated that, uh, you know, these um, psychic healing methodologies uh, mental interaction with living systems, as they call it in, in parapsychology, can be used just as much for harm as for good. And there's no way that you could prosecute somebody, you know, I mean, you couldn't even uh, effectively identify a suspect of a crime like that. So therefore, we would have to move to a type of society that's based less on uh, codified law and, uh, you know, prosecution and so forth, and more fundamentally on ethos, and uh, that's a society of maximal trust. So for that, you need an ethos 
that very cohesively and coherently binds a society together while at the same time uh, you know, not succumbing to totalitarian collectivism. So whatever that ethos is, it has to be an ethos that prioritizes the development of the individual and you know, cultivates free spiritedness. And obviously, you know, this is uh, this is the central challenge that my, I don't know what you want to call it, doctrine of Prometheism is intending to address. And just one more thing on this section is that it reminds me of the Larry Wilson Eight Circuit Brain model where there are these uh, eight neurological circuits, the first four of which are imprinted, you know, between birth and puberty and, and early adulthood that help stabilize life in the world. But then there are these four higher or what Larry sometimes calls boutique circuits that represent future stages in the evolution of humanity. And he, it's clear that these technological developments are actually catalyzing these, these circuits. Like, so uh, mapping the human genome and working with uh, genetics, genetic engineering is actually catalyzing a neurogenetic circuit. Um, and, you know, something like nanotechnics and psionics would be like this sort of neuroatomic or, or quantum non-local circuit. And so it's interesting just to think about the how these technologies are also bringing about changes in our nervous system um, that we could describe as mutations uh, into something, um, you know, something that's beyond man. Yeah, this is a point that um, I made in the book Prometheism a couple of years ago. Um, and I mean, I was already discussing this in Prometheus and Atlas, but but I really uh, I really uh, made a point of it in Prometheism that the evolution of man as such is inseparable from technological development. Technology came first, and then produced man through its transformative effect on uh, hominin physiology. You know, so the use of fire, for example to um, digest food before it's ingested, changed the whole human digestive system and the structure of the human jaw, for example. And tool use, which we've observed even in higher primates, modified the structure of the hominin hand in ways that then you know, made us more quote unquote human. So the human being is itself a product of the developmental trajectory or telos of technology, uh, which makes Luddite attitudes toward technological development for the sake of the preservation of humanity particularly absurd, because humanity itself is, is in effect an, art, an artifact of technology. And um, there's no reason why that evolutionary trajectory should stop uh, you know, at this juncture where we find ourselves. In fact, uh, as I've argued repeatedly, making an evolutionary leap is a survival imperative for anything remotely resembling humanity. It, you know, we such as we are constituted uh, at the present time, not just biologically, but socially and psychologically, are not going to be able to survive the uh, convergent advancements, um, you know, that, that uh, will yield the singularity. Yeah, and it's, um, as you say, technology is ontologically prior to scientific theorization, which is such a profound insight once you actually think that through. And I, I can't remember her name, but the, there's one theoretician that talks about this, the cyborg and how we are already cyborgs. And, and even Marshall McLuhan would say that you know, this the computer is an, just an extension of of our nervous systems right now, and and also our senses, and um, so these luddite attitudes, I, 
I don't think they're really thinking things through and they're not really, um, they're, they're not an accurate assessment of, of the like existential situation of, of humanity, you know? Uh, what I want to go into now is there are uh, there are two epigrams that open the book. One is the um, the pen is mightier than the sword, and then another uh, there's a quote from the artist Basquiat that says, "I am a writer, but sometimes I feel as if I was written. Maybe I wrote myself." And this gets into really important theme in the book, which is that of writing and authorship, which in the book, it, uh, well, for example, from the fact that Dana Avalon has written something like four books that are that are summarized in in Uberman, to the fact that she's trying to rewrite the timeline. Um, and one of the books that she writes introduces a concept called phenomenal authorization, which I think is a really important concept that that you've originated um, and put forth in this book. And can you tell us more about phenomenal authorization? And <clears throat> phenomenal authorization is the idea that there's a relationship between uh, authorship, uh, authority, and authorization. These words that all have author in them: authorship, authority, and authorization. <clears throat> and phenomenal comes in because it's a question of the authorization of what phenomena are possible versus impossible, right? So this has to do with what's branded as paranormal in the context of scientific accounts of the nature of reality. What I argue is that the Kabbalists were right in a sense uh, in a sense which which Franz Kafka understood very well. Um, and also I think Martin Heidegger with his idea of the hermeneutic circle, uh, from which then people like Derrida and so forth developed the idea of deconstruction. Um, they were right to understand that the world is a tapestry of meaning, that, you know, um, logos uh, is is the fabric of the cosmos. You know, in, in Heraclitus's time, the word logos still had its original uh, sig signification as story or account. And it was also understood that logos was like the uh, structural matrix for the cosmos. So the world is like a story that's revisable and at the deepest level it doesn't have a deterministic mathematical logic it has the kind of a, a logic that a story or a dream does right in the sense that you can also have surrealist stories that uh have the quality of a dream they make sense but they they make sense in a way that's non-linear or you know non-rational um and so considering the fact that the world is text, there are certain people who have a power of authorship which allows them to uh, at least collaborate in rewriting the story of the world, right? And this means that those authors, and here I don't mean you know, uh, literary figures in an exclusive sense, but any culture creators, poets, uh, artists, you know, whether painters or sculptors and so forth, filmmakers, anyone engaged in a kind of uh, creative enterprise that reshapes the world of meaning of a people. These authors, through their authorship, are actually authorizing what kinds of phenomena can take place by altering the filter between the conscious and the subconscious mind on a social level, and by reshaping the horizon of what are taken to be possible experiences within the context of any culture, okay? So 
they are literally reshaping the world um, that manifests for a particular people in a particular epoch. And there is also a bi-directional quality to this uh, authorship and authorization of phenomena in the sense that um, I postulate uh, going back to ideas that I explored in in uh, my book, Closer Encounters, I postulate that there is a superhuman intelligence in the future, which is reaching back through time. After all, Uberman is a time travel narrative. There is a superhuman intelligence in the future that is reaching back through time. And just as these authors are authorizing certain phenomena through their uh, you know, culture creation, they in some cases are being authorized by this superhuman intelligence, which has as its categorical imperative or its, you know, uh, primary motivation and objective, maximizing creativity through uh, restructuring society and uh, through fostering, you know, um, innovative works of genius. Uh, that's, you know, in a nutshell, what I mean by phenomenal authorization. The, the uh, authorship of certain uh, creative individuals that authorizes certain phenomena to take place, which then gives them a certain authority that is more fundamental than political authority, and which is also authorized by uh, an even more superordinate authority, namely uh, a, a superhuman intelligence in the future that is attempting to um, eliminate blocks to creativity and break down ossifications so that there can be a continual evolution of human society. I think a good example of some of these points is the very first interview we did, I mentioned something like the attempt in recent years of the US government and military complex to, I guess you, you would say, authorize the reality of the UFO phenomenon and how in some ways that's, it seems like that's problematic because although they have political authority, um, people aren't necessarily, people are skeptical of their claims and what what they're putting out, out there. And it's almost like um, the attempt to define that this is now real, this is a part of our reality. Um, it seems to fit with what you're saying that, um, that, um, that perhaps it would take, can the, can the U.S. government even convince people of the reality of this phenomenon at this point. Uh, do you want to say more on that? On that? And the government does not have the kind of authority that will be required for close encounters to be an authorized human experience. For that kind of experience, you know, uh, close encounters of, you know, the first kind all the way up with UFOs, namely, all the way up to abductions, to be an acknowledged and integral part of human experience on a social level, a different kind of authorization is going to be required. And it's going to come from culture creators uh, and spiritual visionaries who are operating as public intellectuals and who can you know, reshape the horizons of a whole society. Uh, so, you know, I, th I think it'll be, when people like, I don't know, um, Jacques Vallée uh, become mainstream authors whose works are widely read and taught in whatever radically restructured education system we have, it's at that point that this is going to become a uh, you know, mainstream, um, uh, op openly discussable human experience, okay? Uh, and, and this speaks to, uh, you know, a point that I make in that chapter, Phenomenal Authorization in Uberman, where I say that, or rather Dana Avalon explains that 
the machinations of any political leadership in whatever country are always already limited by the horizons of possibility uh, that the culture creators have defined for that particular nation or people, right? I mean, and you know, this is especially clear in democracies, but it's even true in dictatorships that policies can only be made within the context of the norms and expectations of a particular culture. And who determines those? Well, you know, the, the literary figures and the artists of any particular people, right? Uh, it's not the politicians that do that. The politicians are already constrained by that matrix of possibilities. This highlights the fact that sovereignty in a legal sense does not amount to the kind of authority that, um, that is in this relationship with authorship on the one hand and the authorization of phenomena on the other hand. That authority is deeper than political sovereignty and political sovereignty can only be exercised in the context of it and in a way that's bound by its constraints. You know, in that last phase of his life where people said Nietzsche had gone mad, uh, he was writing letters to like various world leaders, this Kaiser and, you know, that prince and the Pope in the Vatican and, you know, uh, basically enjoining them to accept the coming of the Superman and, you know, the end of the Christian world order and so on and so forth. And people take, you know, these letters as another indication of his insanity, right? But they're actually an interesting example of what we were just talking about, because those Kaisers or whoever the hell was the Pope at that time didn't have real authority. Nietzsche had real authority. Nietzsche, who sold not more than a few hundred copies of all of the books he ever wrote in his lifetime, that Frederick Nietzsche wound up fundamentally shaping the uh, higher intellectual and aesthetic culture of at least the first half of the 20th century. Whereas these political figures who he was writing to in the last years of his life became totally irrelevant in retrospect. And also the man suffered terribly, uh, which, which highlights the fact that those individuals who have true authority may wind up you know, living miserable lives or even may be martyred, but their martyrdom actually only enhances their authority. It's like that scene in Star Wars, you know, where Obi-Wan Kenobi says to Darth Vader, uh, if you strike me down now, I'll become more, po more powerful than you can imagine, right? And so th this is part of the nature of the authority that's integrally connected to authorship, uh, and the authorization of phenomena at the level of the matrix of, of possibilities that defines reality uh, by, you know, uh, by allowing certain things as possible experiences and relegating others beyond the margin of possibility into the realm of the impossible. So it's not going to be a, a memo from the office of the White House that is going to persuade the majority of people that there is an actual UFO phenomenon. It's going to have to be someone that ha really has authority. And and it seems like it, would you say that this type of authority is something that unfortunately is only re recognized in retrospect? Like kind of, kind of, in Uh, you got a little choppy in there, but I, I, I grasped the question. Um, is it a kind of authority that is only recognized in retrospect? Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, it seems to be. But there are cases where, even within a person's own lifetime, uh, they, have, um, they have a tremendous capacity to uh, redefine the matrix of possibilities within a culture. I mean, there's a... There's a very uh, sort of trite example that I could give here, which is Stephen King. I mean, um, look, I'm not a particularly uh, you know big fan of Stephen King, and I'm not saying that you know Stephen King uh, is necessarily a very impressive writer from a literary standpoint. 
But it's undeniable that, especially given the folkloric character of King's writing, which penetrates to the depth of the unconscious on a social level, this man within his own lifetime, with you know, the tens of books that he's written, has actually impacted what possible experiences people can have, at least in the English speaking culture of North America, right? Uh, with, with this uh, mechanistic, materialistic, uh, scientific paradigm that we have entrenched, right? Um, there's a tremendous subconscious constraint on being able to even experience things like telepathy and psychokinesis. Parapsychologists have seen that, you know, when you have a deep unconscious bias against these things happening, it actually decreases the likelihood of such manifestations. So when you have a Stephen King churning out tens and tens of books that people take to bed with them at night uh, and, and that insinuate themselves into people's dreams and then, of course, are adapted into big budget films and so forth, that, that is actually phenomenal authorization. It is operating on the level where the filter of what could happen is being adjusted on a social scale. Uh, so there's, there's an example of someone who, you know, didn't necessarily have a miserable life and been tremendously successful in a material sense and within his own lifetime has exercised phenomenal authorization. How would you say that, what about like certain, you know, tech entrepreneurs, Silicon Valley people, um, you know, Facebook, Metaverse, Twitter, you know, what, how can, would you, what would you say to that from this perspective? I mean, are they, I mean, they're shaping our majority of our uh, discourse today uh, in some way. I mean, the, the, struct, the context. Managers. They are information managers, right? I mean, like a, a Jeff Bezos or a Mark Zuckerberg um, are managing information, but I don't see them creating any uh, meaning or contributing to the reweaving of the tapestry of meaning that holds the world of our society together. In fact, if anything, they're attempting to control information in a way that would prevent that from happening. You know, they, they have a generally conservative uh, you know, uh, modus operandi that uh, aims to reinforce the establishment and to prevent this tapestry of meaning from being rewoven by culture creators that can act on the level of the collective unconscious. So, so no, I, I wouldn't see those people as having, you know, phenomenal authorization. Um, and, I, and I think that to go back to the UFO question, well, first of all, to an extent, it's in the hands of the phenomenon itself, right? Because the day that these, uh, let's just call them people, uh, decide to appear en masse over major cities or land somewhere is the day that disclosure will take place on their terms and not ours, right? So there's that. But putting that aside, let's just bracket that for a minute. Even were that not to take place in the near term, disclosure will really happen when these people who I'm describing with phenomenal authorization wind up being able to create a whole new society which accepts close encounters as a given. And, you know, it, that'll just be a social fact of that new community. Uh, and the more that community becomes dominant and displaces the existing forms of society, the more, quote unquote, disclosure will become a reality. So phenomenal authorization has a lot to do with re, re, someone that can renegotiate the boundaries between the real and the imaginary, let's, let's say, and can authorize you know and, and it's wild because what you're saying and i think this is part of the deeper ontology of your your worldview is that well anything is possible right it's like the imagination is real and it's just a matter of authorizing authorization that can bring any can make anything real <laughs> you know and it, almost in a sort of I don't want to say new age or like new thought sense, but it's kind of something similar to that or something like um, 
some of the ideas that I got from the the book, The Holographic Universe. You know, the um, the the implicate order um, realm of infinite possibilities, and uh, yeah, and it looked like you wanted to say something on that. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to the opening quote, the the epigram of Prometheus and Atlas, which was this quote from uh, Albert Camus' Caligula play, where Caligula is talking about the one real revolution in the world as the revolution that would make the impossible possible. And uh, my work has been developing that idea all the way through up to, you know, the discussion of close encounters in the context of Charles Ford in the book immediately previous to this one, um, where, you know, I basically argue just what you said, that together with Charles Ford, I argue that anything is really possible. It's a question of the structures of knowledge and the systems of power that they uh, make possible and reinforce. And those are very difficult to change. It's, you know, it's not, and this is where the new agers and positive thinking people uh, you know, come up very short because they have a very facile, trite view of, you know, how easy it is to imagine a new reality into being and whatever. No, it's actually very hard. And you have to change large scale social structures and very deeply rooted, you know, belief systems on a subconscious level. But if you manage to do that, yeah, actually things that were considered totally impossible will start to happen on a large scale. Uh, which, you know, could be apocalyptic, right? I mean, it's, it's epoch ending, apocalyptic in the sense that it brings a certain world to an end and it, you know, inaugurates a new world. Well, and, and with your two novels now, Faustian Futurist and Uberman, similarly to what you were saying about Stephen King's influence on on the imagination and what, we can entertain as possible in our own lives. Uh, you know, these two novels, what's so dangerous and disturbing about them is that they, I mean, there are ideas that are in my mind now that, you know, never were there before possi you know, possibilities of whether it's Atlantis or the, this uh, Olympian elite um, breakaway civilization and underground cities and, um, and it's almost like, um, you know, and it's, a, it, it's, you know, I have no way to prove or disprove, you know, these, these, you know, these are all ideas to me. Um, but it's like, they're, they're very powerfully with all of your work, but, and with, and the way that the novels work at a narrative level on the imagination, it's, um, it's doing that. It's bringing a, a, a new reality into being, which which is sort of furthering. It. And it's almost like, why would you want this reality to be real? Um, this kind of gets into novel folklore, and it. And what I've thought about is that these ideas put us right into the center of like the Prome Promethean drama, I suppose, uh, as. You know what I mean? Uh, that conflict. Absolutely, absolutely. It it uh, it's the structure of a tragic myth. Um, I mean, and and you know, very closely modeled on the actual tragic myth of Prometheus, where you have the Olympians, right, as the antagonists. But uh, it doesn't just kind of get to novel folklore. I mean, yeah, this is what novel folklore is all about. My concept of novel folklore. Um, you know, was developed with a significant debt both to Heidegger on the one hand and and uh, to Jacques Vallée on the other in the context of his study of uh, close encounters um, through the lens of uh, comparative folklore. And the idea of novel, fo novel folklore in a nutshell, because I, you know, this is something I've discussed in, in numerous other contexts, so I won't belabor it, but is that it goes back to what Heidegger says in Being in Time about the nature of truth. There's this part in being in time, which I think probably makes the most radical claim uh, of any that Heidegger uh, makes anywhere in that book or in any other text. 
And it's in the context of his discussion of the nature of truth as aletheia or unconcealment rather than uh, veritas or verificational correspondence. And so, you know, the, the ancient Greeks, their word for truth, aletheia, means unconcealment or disclosure or discovery, an uncovering. It's a privative, okay? Uh, and Heidegger explains that the way in which something is uncovered, uh, the way in which it's brought out of occultation and becomes a quote unquote truth, a reality as it were, is dependent upon the horizon of meaning of the world of one or another people one or another folk. And then, you know, a bunch of postmoderns really abused this notion of the relativity of truth, and they got cultural relativism from out of it, which is a bastardization. But Heidegger was making what I think is a legitimate point about the relationship between consciousness and quote-unquote reality, namely the following, that what is taken to be true does depend upon the tapestry of meaning that allows the world of a particular people to hang together. And so, you know, when Heidegger uses the strange formulation, the worldhood of the world in being and time, uh, it's not just lost on a lot of contemporary interpreters, it's hidden by a lot of contemporary interpreters that there isn't a single world. The worldhood of the world is different based on which folk or people you're talking about. And the most radical point that Heidegger makes in that part of Being in Time, and then he expands on it in other texts, like um, the one on language, what was it called? Something about, uh, it's about the, you know, poetry as the most essential form of language. It's it on a, the way to language? No, it's not one of those mainstream texts. It's a more obscure, on the essence of language is what it was. And in this text on the essence of language, he expands this argument from being in time. But essentially, the argument is the following, that the tapestry of meaning of a particular people is, is in the first place, or most primarily, defined by the poets of that people. And when he says, you know, poets of the people, today it could be a filmmaker, it could be George Lucas, okay? So what... Uh, is taken to be true is more primarily being determined by a matrix of possibilities marked out by the poets that shape the world of a particular people. On what level? Well, on the level of folk lore. Folk lore, the lore of a folk, is a more fundamental form of history. History is derivative. Historia is a more um, uh, rigorous, more highly structured, complex form of what originally is folklore in any and every culture. And I mean, Heidegger goes into this whole thing about how the word historia is related to the word uh, for like exploration, like, you know, naval vessels or like the Vikings going on exploratory journeys. And this is connected, you know, to Folklore at a fundamental level as well, because where a culture can go is defined by the, the poems that are sung by the bards of a culture. So like, for example, the Odyssey is what sets the ships of the ancient Greek sailing looking for new lands, right? I mean, they are in a way internalizing and embodying the adventure of Odysseus. And so uh, my idea of novel folklore draws on this aspect of Heidegger, and uh, also on Jacques Vallée's uh, identification of the phenomenon of close encounters going back through the history of folklore in various cultures. And um, I argue that basically, uh, in order to redefine what's possible, you have to change culture on a folkloric level, which means you have to become an author of novel folklore a kind of contradiction in terms because people think of the novel as quintessentially modern and a folklore as something that's as static as you can get in terms of a narrative structure and passed on 
you know, mimetically via oral tradition and so forth. So it's a little bit counterintuitive to imagine that someone could very deliberatively re-engineer the folklore of a people so as to make certain experiences possible for those people, experiences which were hitherto deemed impossible or fantastical. Yeah, it's like you're saying that the Odyssey and works like that are a, a paradigm that the, those people are living out, whether they are conscious of it or not. Yeah. Well, you mentioned modernity, and we don't have to spend too much time on on this, if this is getting away from these really stimulating ideas that we're talking about, but I, I uh, Dana Avalon, the protagonist of U Uberman, wrote a book called The Future of Modernity, and it's a, a really compelling critique of postmodernism. And, and, and let me see how I could put this. It's um, one of the ideas here is that at the at the bottom of postmodernism that is responsible for like the its nihilism and aversion to authority is the idea of simul the theory of simulacra or the paradox of simulacra that are lacking in an original as you said and that um and because of that it promotes like the delusion that nothing is real nothing really matters but then you you went on to say that the all pervasive and this is a quote the all pervasive simulacrum idea is a perversion of the perf perfectly legitimate conception of a cyberspace coextensive with the cosmos an observer dependent and potentially programmable qu quantum computing holographic universe with fractal generating chaos as its unfathomable and unpredictable background and then there is nothing postmodern about this idea can you say more about that? You know, it's it's ironic, and you know, a word that's very relevant to postmodernism. Ironic, right? Uh, everything is ironic from a postmodern perspective. Um, it's ironic that uh, the idea of the simulacrum would uh, intensify the nihilism that's characteristic of the postmodern mindset uh, because supposedly it's central to postmodern thought to deconstruct this verificational conception of truth where there's an objective reality, right? And then there's uh, how that reality is mirrored in one's structure of knowledge, right? So, you know, th this uh, idea that, you know, begins with people like Rene Descartes and, uh, you know, in, in the epoch of uh, John Locke, right, in the, the zenith of the Enlightenment, that there's an objective truth about the nature of reality, and that in the well-polished mirror of our rational minds, we can ascertain uh, and discern the um, complexities of that structure, right? And by means of doing that, we can have uh, you know more effective control over that na natural world. That's an idea that supposedly uh, has been deconstructed in postmodernity. In fact, it's probably the single most significant target of you know uh, postmodernist critiques of uh, modern rationalism. And yet, at least implicitly and subconsciously, these postmoderns devalue the world on the basis of the idea uh, that everything is a simulacrum, right? Well, why, why would you do that if, you know, you don't believe that any of these simulacra really have an original? If there's no original anywhere, if our, if our world is not a simulation in the context of uh, or a simulation that's a second order representation of some putatively objective reality, then why would the fact that things are simulacra devalue their meaning, right? I mean, 
uh, works of art are simulacra. I mean, they always say, you know, Greek sculptures that are copies of other sculptures or multiple sculptures that are identical that were used in the construction of, say, a temple were not thereby devalued. Okay, even though, I mean, none of them is necessarily an original, quote unquote. Uh, so there's this bizarre and, and subconscious irony to uh, postmodern nihilism that I think um, betrays an enduring commitment to the conception of truth that you find in some of the more superficial thinkers of the Age of Enlightenment. The, these uh, postmoderns claim that they've given up the verificational conception of truth, but really they haven't. And a lot of their nihilism uh, is, is based on you know, a, an enduring tacit commitment to that conception of truth. Whereas if you just acknowledge that both physics and computer science are now pointing us toward the conclusion that we're living inside some kind of a quantum computational system, that what this cosmos is, is a meaning machine. It's a kind of information processing system where consciousness is inextricable from physical processes. Uh, then you stop thinking in terms of what's original and what's a copy, right? Um, and it could be that our world is a kind of uh, constructed or artificial um, domain of experience, that it's a kind of a, you know, a tron or arena that's been to some extent artificially manufactured, like, uh, you know, the park in Westworld, for example. But as the series Westworld you know, makes this point very effectively. That doesn't mean the world outside Westworld is more real than Westworld. And this, this is one of the great points made by that series, is that ultimately it's possible for the androids in Westworld to become more human than the humans in the outer world. And it, it's uh, possible for them to actually reshape that context, uh, you know, that, that their world is, is uh, set inside of uh, in a way where, um, you know, what was seen as a second order or derivative reality is actually recoding what was believed to have been the primary reality, right? And so my conception of the nature of the cosmos, uh, drawing from people like David Bohm and uh, Michael Talbot and by authors who I think have phenomenal authorization, like Philip K. Dick, is a conception of a quantum computational system uh, that um, you know, is bottomless, where there's no fundamental level of reality, capital R. And, you know, we're basically um, inside of a virtuality that, uh, that is, is nested within, you know, uh, various layers and levels of worlds within worlds. And these can interpenetrate one another and they can recode each other. Uh, in a way that's not necessarily hierarchical. Uh, I mean, another great example of this is uh, 13th Floor, the film 13th Floor, where there are these nested simulations and someone from a lower order simulation is able to uh, not only you know, uh, penetrate into a quote unquote or putatively higher level of reality, but able to reshape that world and reshape events on that level. You know, you just reminded me of something. When I I read the holographic universe when I was like 12 or 13, and I kind of misunderstood the point of it, and I, I almost like in, interpreted it in a postmodern sense because it, it put me in this place where I felt like, well, nothing is really real. It's all just, it's all a, a simulation. And then a friend of mine who had also read the book that I was talking to said something like, well, no, things are as real as you want them to be. Something like that, you know, and in that moment, it like clicked with me and, um, and yeah, so I mean, I, something kind of like what you're saying in a way. Well, yeah, I mean, and this is to go back to the point I was making about Heidegger and novel folklore. What is real is defined in the first place 
by the narrative of a culture or by the narratives that you know co-constitute the uh, the world of meaning of a particular people, right? I mean, that, that is what makes something real in the first place. Um, and, you know, scientific knowledge is only secondary and derivative of that, which is, you know, a horrifying thing for uh, rationalists to accept, but nonetheless true, because technology is more fundamental than the uh, various um, structures of knowledge that it makes possible. And technology is in the first instance craft and how craft uh, you know, um, is employed and the way in which we cultivate various crafts is again determined by the craft of uh, narrative and you know, articulating a particular logos. But to go back, I wanted to say some things about this, this whole question of the modern versus the, the postmodern, uh, more with a view to aesthetics. The point that I make in that part of Uberman um, where I'm going into a discussion of Dana Avalon's uh, writings on the nature of modernity and her, you know, cr critique of the whole idea of postmodernity. Uh, one of the points that I make is that there's really nothing about postmodern art or literature that's any more, uh, you know illuminatively or innovatively deconstructive than what you find in Dadaism or Surrealism or any of the modernist uh, aesthetic movements of the early 20th century. And it's also a grave misconception that modernism is somehow uh, fundamentally materialistic. You know, Surrealism is a term that Andre Breton came up with specifically in order to describe uh, paranormal psychic functioning. When he defined surrealism as, as pure psychic automatism, I think in an article called The Entry of the Mediums in uh, Literature Magazine in 1922, it was specifically in the context of his discussion of the mediumistic exercises that he and his associates had been involved, uh, had been engaged in in Paris. And in fact, the woman, uh, I think her name was Adrienne Monnier, who brought together uh, the core group of surrealists was herself an occultist. And she basically facilitated seances where the, um, the founding members of the surrealist movement entered into such a profound telepathic communication with one another that you know, some of them would get ailments that others of them were suffering from. They would be telepathically transmitted. You know, uh, there were even instances of psychokinesis that, for example, Max Ernst claims that he saw a hat and, and a, uh, a coat, I think it was that, no, it was a hat, move itself from one coat rack to another. There was a, an article in Scientific American called something like Order and Pollock's Chaos. And it um, was a study done by this guy, Richard P. Taylor, uh, that revealed there are fractals at multiple levels of magnification in Jackson Pollock paintings. And yet, if you take, you know, fake Pollocks or like, you know, uh, imitation abstract expressionist paintings and you put them through the same computer program that analyzes fractals, the fractals in nature uh, or fractals in Jackson Pollock paintings, you see that none of these imitation Pollocks, which could in some cases even fool a sophisticated art critic, none of them have these fractals in them. And you know, there's no way that uh, someone like Pollock could deliberately and consciously have done this you know, while he was producing these canvases. I mean, there's, some, there's something about the way that he danced around that canvas in a kind of Native American you know, shamanic movement that allowed him to be a medium for the same kinds of pattern formation that we see uh, in nature, in, in various natural organisms that display fractals. And interestingly, if, you know, you look at early Jackson Pollock paintings from the 1940s, before he goes into this abstract expressionist phase, 
they basically are surrealism. So, you know, early Jackson Pollock is a surrealist. And therefore, one of the misconceptions about modernity is that it's as materialist as, you know, uh, as some of the um, higher intellectual writers of the Age of Enlightenment were materialist. That's not the case. There were many moderns who were profoundly engaged with the occult, whether they were writers or painters or whatever, with the difference being that their modern approach to the occult is Promethean in spirit. It's about, you know, the individual's relationship with these latent capacities and the ways in which they can be uh, constructively and pragmatically integrated by society rather than being considered miraculous abilities or manifestations that reaffirm some kind of hierarchical power structure, you know, in the way that they did in medieval Catholic Europe or the way that, you know, ancient Hindus would conceive of cities. Uh, so one of the things that I point to in Uberman is a distinction between two different types of modernity, a, an anti-tradition that is reductively materialist and mechanistic, and then a counter tradition, which uh, is profoundly engaged with the occult, but in a kind of Promethean or Faustian fashion. And this is a distinction that I'm adopting from the traditionalist writer Rene Ganon, who you know, noted that there would be two phases of modernity. This initial phase that's reductively materialistic and mechanistic that you saw you know, uh, basically reach its uh, zenith in the French Revolution, specifically with the reign of the cult of reason, and then a subsequent phase of, of um, modernity, which I think he identified like theosophy and anthroposophy as heralds of in his own time, this subsequent phase of modernity that um, from his traditionalist perspective, he saw effectively as the arrival of the Antichrist, uh, the harnessing of occult abilities and the cultivation of latent powers for the sake of human empowerment. Uh, you know, which from Ganon's perspective is satanic, but from my perspective is, you know, uh, a Promethean evolution into something positively post-human. You know, they did a similar analysis of works of literature as they did with Jackson Pollock, and um, they found that Finnegan's Wake James Joyce had the most fractals of any of the other uh, works in the sample. So, yeah, that that's amazing. Well, there's a couple. Of Another point I want to make in that regard, is, and that that makes a lot of sense to me that 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 would have been the case. Um, one of the other points that I wanted to make in that regard, though, uh, in terms of the aesthetics of modernity and traditionalism, which I've referenced now in the context of René Ganon and his, his distinction between the modern anti-tradition and the modern counter-tradition, is that one of the hallmarks of postmodern art is supposed to be this kind of uh, amalgamation of the styles of different epochs, this breaking out of a linear relationship to stylistic change over the course of history. So that, for example, in a postmodern work of architecture, you could see uh, neoclassical elements mixed with modernist elements. How is that postmodern when in Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, you already see both archaic elements and modernist elements, you know, seamlessly fused together in this kind of archaeofuturistic style, which you know, uh, unlike postmodernity, is is uh, unironic and is inspiring and continues to basically provide an architectonic of meaning for an entire culture. Or, or even if you want to talk about deconstructive artwork, uh, how is any work of, of uh, so-called art in postmodernity more deconstructive than what the Dadaists were doing in the 1910s? I just don't see where where is this distinction anyway coming from, and, and ultimately the the abandonment of the project of you know producing new meaning for a society and you know um, basically inspiring 
continually constructive projects for a particular people. It's the abandonment of that uh, motivation and inspiration and the kind of surrender to sarcasm, cynicism, and irony that I think is most uh, legitimately characteristic of, of postmodernity and what separates it from modernism, not any particular uh, stylistic features or uh, even anything having to do with the critique of truth and reality and objectivity, which we saw beginning with Nietzsche and running all the way through, you know, the surrealists and, and the futurists. And yeah, so uh, I don't know if you want to uh, ha have a rejoinder or, to that or, or make any comment on it. Yeah, well, I guess when I was in a rather clumsy way writing about hyper modernity, one of the things that I was saying was that it represented the absolutization and even fulfillment of modernity. And I saw that uh, symbolized in the icon of the, the cloud, you know, the digital cloud, which is precisely this notion, to quote you again here, of a cyberspace coextensive with the cosmos, a, a programmable quantum computing holographic universe. And you relate that idea of this kind of um, all-encompassing uh, simulacrum uh, as the zenith of modernity. So it sounds like there's a convergence here of, of what I was thinking well, about what hypermodernity meant and what you're saying about modernity. So Absolutely. What you call hypermodernity uh, is what I'm calling in Uberman the future of modernity. In other words, it's a reaffirmation of the future that was imagined uh, and hoped for by the moderns, right? It's, it's uh, when, when I use this formulation, the future of modernity in Uberman, it's not just a reference to temporally some future phase of the phenomenon that is modernity. It's also th the fact that modernity is about the future. Modernity is all about uh, having a futural relationship to our existential experience of time. And that's what distinguishes the modern from the traditional. I, I actually accept Rene Ganon's view that there really are only two forms of society, traditional society and modern society. And our whole conception that like, there were these successive phases from ancient times through you know, the medieval epoch, through the Renaissance, ultimately up to the modern age, and then maybe beyond to a postmodern age, where modernity is you know, one of a series of successive epochs a view that I tacitly accepted in the past and you know, was a background to some of my writings, I think that view is false. I've come around to thinking it's false. And that really, it, really, it is more like a switch. It's like an on-off switch. And what determines how the switch is thrown is uh, your attitude toward the technological singularity. Because if your attitude is the Olympian, uh, you know, the Olympian one, that the convergence of these technologies like you know, nanotech, uh, genetic engineering, robotics, cybernetics, and so forth, it is so threatening to what it means to be human that basically we have to create a highly controlled society that's hierarchical where most people uh, are um, shielded and sheltered from these technologies. A view that you see, frankly, in the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu says this in the Tao Te Ching, keep technology away from the people. If, if that's your attitude, that only some self-appointed elite of gods should have access to this technology and the people should be kept in ignorance so that the basic structures of what's taken to be a proper human society are preserved, well, then you're gonna have the switch in the off position and you're gonna have a traditional society. If you flip the switch, and accept the challenge of reshaping society in a way where we can constructively navigate this technological singularity and come out the other side of this vortex, well, then you're in the modern mode and you're going to have a modern society, a society that's affirming this movement, this process, this evolution into an infinite future horizon. So the future of modernity is the commitment to a society that embraces the future, meaning 
a form of life that's not what we have now or that we had in the past. And, you know, an acceptance of the challenge of undergoing further evolution. It's the, the epitome of what modernity was always reaching for. And our willingness to reaffirm that rather than surrendering to cynicism and nihilism. And this is a point that Nietzsche made too in his writings that he said, you know, the same conditions that will bring about the evolution of the Uberman will paralyze, diminish, and degenerate humans into something subhuman. And that he thought the masses would in fact surrender to crippling uh, nihilism, that you know, the same challenges in terms of um, industry and uh, economic restructuring and power on a planetary scale uh, and, and media and the transmission of information and so forth, these same uh, transformations of technology and society that would act as a breeding agent, bringing the Superman into being, would result in mass paralysis and degeneration for most people uh, who would actually become subhuman or untermenschen. And so this would be a kind of bifurcation of humanity into a race of robots on the one hand and a uh, a race of basically um, creative geniuses and uh, a kind of spiritual aristocracy on the other hand. Fantastic. You describe a trend in Uberman. You describe a trend beginning in the 2040s of simulacra construction, which are habitats that are reconstructions of past eras and that many of the super rich will retreat into these micro cities that are modeled on the aesthetic and lifestyles of past epochs. Um, and the most popular are communities modeled on 1980s America. Uh, you also describe these as total environments. Um, can you say more about these cities that you imagine in, in the future? Yeah, um, I'll reveal something here, which I've never discussed publicly. I didn't just make this idea up. Um, I had a strange experience once where I, I guess you'd call it a kind of a vivid daydream. Um, it was in the middle of the day and uh, it was basically like a dream state, but there was something <clears throat> somewhat more hallucinatory about it than dreamlike. And I was standing on a on a sloped sidewalk in Manhattan in uh, the Upper East Side. And this young woman who, oddly enough, in retrospect, I realized looked a lot like me in certain ways, came up to me on the sidewalk, stopped me, came up to me on the sidewalk. And she was dressed in uh, kind of in a kind of very like tomboy kind of environmentalist kind of fashion, like like someone who you you would uh, you would imagine in the Amazon rainforest or something. Like that was the vibe of the way she was dressed. And she said to me, she she was uh, telling me that I needed to focus on. Um, critiquing the way that the world is in the present, because a lot of what I think about the future and how humanity will evolve will never come to pass. She said, I, I, I come from a world where people have retreated into simulations of the past. They live in, in things that are like theme parks that reconstruct particular epochs. And, um, no one, no one cares about this future that you're envisioning anymore. They just, the world is so miserable and people have suffered so much that they just want to recreate pockets of the past that they can retreat into for some, you know, uh, peace and uh, stability in the, in the context of a collapsing world. And so this is where, you know, the germ of this idea came from, was this experience that I had. Yeah, and it seems like a very likely scenario in the future, even in the near future, 
and not necessarily all done through literal construction, but something like the metaverse and augmented reality. You can imagine a situation where we don't really have computers anymore, but you sort of wear your computer. It's contact lenses and you kind of live inside of it. And, you know, perhaps cities become empty and more like blank screens. And you can basically, you know, dial in whatever aesthetic you want the city to be like, you know, projected, you know, in a three dimensional uh, image, like kind of painted on your retina, where it's the same like advertisements and you're seeing this, you're seeing the same consensual signifiers as ever, everyone else, but you're seeing them in the, in the, in the style of the 1980s or, or of the old West or something like that. You can even imagine this happening just with um, just digitally, you know what I'm saying? But um, yeah, it's a fascinating idea. And also that anecdote that you shared about that visionary daydream with a, a woman who sounds a lot like Dana Avalon, the protagonist of Uberman. Well, you you share other anecdotes in this book of high strangeness in your own life. Would you be open to talking about any of those or sh maybe sharing one other one that Sure, but you yeah. uh, you take the angle of approach there in, in terms of what you want to focus on specifically. There were some really powerful dreams that you described in the book. And I was wondering if those were actual dreams that you'd had or. Um, Give me an example. Yeah. Well, there's one there's this one dream where you're walking through a forest you get lost and there are a couple of houses i'm just trying to remember this off the top of my head and and there's like a wolf man at one of the houses oh um, yeah that happened i'll never forget it yeah that's uh that's a literal uh description of uh this nightmare that i had um which uh, has stayed with me throughout the years and and which I think uh, in some ways well let's just say it was a precognitive dream in some ways not to say prophetic in terms of my own development in my life yes yeah and that's what was really profound about it too was something like one of the houses represented what your life would be had you not f lived up to your potential or fulfilled your destiny or something like that Anyway, I, this is something people will, will just have to read. And there's, you share a lot of personal visionary and paranormal experiences that you've had in your life in this book. And it's, yeah, they're really fascinating and an important part of the narrative and, and maybe, maybe key to understanding your whole project. But, um, maybe sort of obliquely related to that is that when you first sent me the manuscript for uberman you said that it ultimately it's a surrealist novel and i was wondering if you could say more about what you mean by that sure um you know we were discussing surrealism uh a moment ago and uh how Andre Breton coined that term surrealism to refer to the restructuring of the relationship between the conscious mind and the subconscious and the development of a form of art that would allow the subconscious to express itself without ra or with as little rational mediation as possible. It was a basically a kind of mediumistic exercise that these surrealists were engaging in, whether their medium was poetry or painting or whatever particular art form, they were aiming at what Breton called psychic automatism, to directly express the contents of the subconscious without allowing the rational mind to, you know, filter them. 
or allowing social expectations that are internalized by the rational mind to filter the contents of the subconscious and the various insights and visions that one might have uh, on a subconscious level. And so in that sense, I think it is legitimate to, although there's a lot of rational deliberation that obviously went into uh, composing Uberman, still I think it's legitimate to describe it as a surrealist work, not just stylistically, because there are certain passages that, you know, are, are like surrealist narratives, uh, or say if it were to be adapted into a film, which I think it should be, uh, there would be sequences that would appear surrealist in style, like David Lynch films, right? Not just for those more superficial reasons, but because the project of writing this book required me to remove that filter between the subconscious mind and the conscious mind. And, you know, all those things you were referring to a moment ago in terms of uh, confessions that have to do with experiences that I've had, uh, paranormal experiences in particular, they, they, they demand a shutting off of the filter mechanism and a kind of bracketing of the uh, you know, social expectations that militate against my being able to craft a narrative like this. And so, yeah, I mean, the whole, the, the project of writing this book was an exercise in psychic automatism to a certain degree. And uh, it's extremely dangerous to do something like that. It's dangerous because it renders the person doing it extremely vulnerable. And I think it's also dangerous because, and I think the surrealists were aiming at this as well, it's also dangerous because that kind of creative activity is contagious. If you're able to do that yourself and produce a work that, um, it has manifested in that manner, someone who allows that work into their own psyche undergoes a transformative process that similarly restructures that filter between the conscious and the subconscious. Uh, and I think, as I was suggesting in our earlier discussion of surrealism, this kind of psychic contagion was an aspect of the mediumistic exercises that the surrealists engaged in. So, yeah, um, I don't know if that's responsive enough. Yeah, and one of the the book also uses time as a to create a kind of layering effect. And I've often had this notion that one way of thinking about the unconscious is that it's not is that it's time. It's like the dimension of time, like the fourth dimension, not just the past, like in the Freudian sense, but also works of art, you know, seem to anticipate what's to come. Um, like, for example, going back now and reading surrealist poetry, whether like Andre Breton or Robert Desnos and others, I try to imagine, I try to think like, what, what is the space that they're describing here where you have like these floating signifiers and these, these transformations happening? And it seems like what they're, what they were foreseeing is actually like the internet, like cyberspace in a way, you know, and it, and, you know, it's, it's almost like surrealism has become just, we live in surrealism now. It's become integrated into, into our world. I mean, what else is cyberspace, but the, the, the flow of these signifiers that, um, and so having, so being, being able to look back at surrealist art and poetry, it sort of puts it in this, this frame, it kind of puts it in a um, in a context that where it suddenly makes sense in a way that, um, well, anyway, yeah, there's just something about time as the fourth dimension and how you are folding that in and traversing yeah, time. The book is part, it's not just about time travel, it's about a hyper-dimensional relationship to time that beyond this 4D, you know, chronological linear experience of time that we're accustomed to having. And I, I think you're absolutely right that the surrealists were after that. They were after that hyperdimensional relationship with time. 
And I mean, Andre Breton, I believe, even had this phrase of his put on his tombstone, uh, je cherche l'or du temps, I seek the gold of time. And that, that was his like modus operandi, ultimately. Yeah, and it's interesting, just something that we talked about before was the, the work of Gene Gebser and his idea of consciousness structures that humanity has passed through in throughout prehistory and and now in history and that he believed that we are because mutation is also a theme in your book time and mutation of humanity into something new into an uberman right and i i think it's interesting that uh, gebser believed that we there's a new there's a new consciousness structure that's emerging a mutation of consciousness where th time is its is its main theme, and um, and the time becoming sort of integrated into our consciousness as a dimension that you can sort of you know traverse or see through, similarly to the way that the the, the current structure, the, what he calls the mental structure, conquered space, three dimensional space, you know, with the invention of depth perspective, um, or even the, or even someone like Parmenides at the beginning of the mental structure be, being able to, to conquer space by imagining the entire cosmos as a globe, you know what I'm saying? Um, um, so the, the theme of the, this most recent structure that is in decline right now uh, was, was three-dimensional space, and now time is emerging, and, and he saw that signs of this nascent consciousness structure in modernist art, that that's what led him to uh, to come up with this idea. You know, for example, looking at uh, cubism, where you're in cubism, it's the time is sort of folded into the um, into the painting because you're seeing an object uh, from multiple perspectives at once. It's what Gebser calls a perspectival, and which is the way something would look from outside of time because it takes time to traverse walk around an object and see it from all sides. So, you know, and the theme of the previous structure would put that linearly, like on a film strip or something like that. But um, but in cubism, you're getting a, a, a vision of what this a perspectival time conscious, time free consciousness would be. And he also calls it, the, the theme is um, time freedom. And he has this term called the a chronon, which I thought you would like <laughs> because of chronos time and um, but the idea is that essentially this liberation from time um, by time becoming a, a fourth dimension that that um, we can participate in um, in a way that's analogous to three-dimensional space so I don't know if you want to say anything more on, on that yeah I mean cubism is a very clear example but you can even see it in some of the futurist paintings where the futurists are are trying to portray speed, and you know this is all over the futurist manifesto, Marinetti's you know futurist manifesto, the the idea of the conquest of time. I think that's actually the central theme of the futurist manifesto is the power that techno technology will afford us to reshape our relationship not just with space but with time and to ultimately conquer time. Um, Space and time died yesterday, exclamation point, right? I mean, this is one of the lines from the Futurist Manifesto. And you're right that the conquest of Kronos is at the core of my work. And I think there are aspects of my work that certain people haven't connected, which make this even clearer. Like, for example, in Iranian Leviathan, uh, at considerable length, I go into this Mithraic myth of Mithra's overpowering of Zorvan, who is basically Kronos, and you know, which, which was symbolized by the procession of the equinoxes, Mithra going out over and above the celestial sphere and taking the reins, as it were, from Kronos and basically becoming a master over time and fate, uh, no longer being subject to celestial determinism. Right, uh, no longer being a victim of um, astrological forces that 
are the puppet strings Kronos uses to control our lives. So that whole, uh, I guess you'll call it ontotheological discussion in Iranian Leviathan should be put alongside the things I say about Prometheus and Kronos in writings that are more relevant to Prometheism. And, and so when you bring all of that together, you realize that actually, and, and also, you know, the stuff I say about Project Kronos, right? The engineering of the bell in, you know, the mid 20th century by what became the breakaway civilization. When you draw all of that together, you realize that actually the idea of power over time is at the core of my entire project. And I'm coming at it in various ways, you know, in various books of mine. Well, Uberman is also, besides being a surreal a work of surrealism, it's also a geopolitical spy thriller, in which our geopolitics are a central concern of the book. And one of Dana Avalon's objectives in traveling back to the 1980s is to insinuate herself onto the geopolitical stage to ultimately forge an alliance between the United States and the Soviet Union. And you describe the two countries in Uberman as the right and left fists of Prometheus. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so Marx basically saw Prometheus as his personal god and as a savior figure for humanity. Uh, Marx, whose ideology is commonly described as atheistic, you know, and materialistic, actually had a tremendous reverence for Prometheus, um, which is all over his letters that he wrote in his youth to his uh, girlfriend, or I think then fiance. And um, the Promethean myth was so important to him, and Prometheus to him was, you know, such a patriarch of philosophy and science that, uh, you know, a whole book has been written called, um, Prometheus Unbound, about how the Prometheus myth is uh, the core structure of Marx's entire thought. So I would refer people to that book, that study, Prometheus Unbound, to see how Marxism at its foundation is quite Promethean. And then uh, besides, you know, Marxism at, at its foundation being Promethean, you had a whole Russian cosmist movement, which actually evolved from out of uh, heretical Russian Orthodox theosophy, let's call it, not to say philosophy. And at a certain point, uh, some of these um, Russian cosmists, uh, like Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, left the husk of orthodoxy behind altogether and developed this uh, vision of human self-directed evolution and expansion into the cosmos in a completely Promethean direction. So at its foundation, the Soviet Union had two currents of Prometheism coming into it, one from Marxism and the other from Russian cosmism. And especially in Tsiolkovsky and the way that he uh, laid the groundwork for the, the Russian rocketry program and also in the pioneers of psychotronics in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, again, contrary to the common misconception that they were, uh, you know, that the leaders of the Soviet Union were facilely materialist in their outlook or, you know, reductively mechanistic thinkers, the Soviet Union was ahead of the United States in parapsychology. They called their parapsychology program psychotronics. And both in the rocketry program that, you know, uh, cosmists like Tsiolkovsky laid the groundwork for, and in the psychotronics program, you see uh, hyper Promethean mentality embodied by the Soviet Union, which was hell bent on progress um, and, you know, willing to consider the prospect of further human evolution uh, for the sake of freedom from all kinds of oppressive constraints, you know, uh, on, on uh, the human individual and on society um, under capitalism and, and, and you know, uh, in the context of, of the modern industrial way of life. So I think it's legitimate 
to describe the Soviet aspiration for a liberation of the human individual through the power of technology and a reorganization of society in a way that would eliminate the last form of slavery, namely wage slavery, as a Promethean ambition. Uh, and so in Uberman, I make the point that the Soviet Union and the United States had a kind of um, dialectical, uh, mutually reinforcing relationship with one another, where in their own ways, they were both aiming at a Promethean future for humanity and uh, you know, basically engineering the collapse of the Soviet Union ultimately wound up precipitating the collapse of the United States, which I envision as I did in Faustian Futurist, taking place, you know, let's say a decade to two decades from now, uh, so that um, ultimately a global traditionalist imperium can be ushered in through the hegemony of China, a country with a, a culture that's very paternalistic and conservative uh, and that's uh, absolutely horrified of change, okay? And that rejects the idea of progress on a fundamental level. I'm talking about the Confucianist culture of China, which at this point basically has been re-embraced by the Chinese managerial elite um, uh, in a way that's that's you know sidelined the more Marxist aspirations of Mao. So so basically, yeah, in Uberman, Dana Avalon attempts to rewrite the timeline so that the United States and the Soviet Union can continue to have a constructive rivalry. And so that together with their massive nuclear arsenals, they could potentially protect humanity uh, against this um, subjugation that we're going to face at the hands of the Olympians and, and this uh, forced restoration of tradition worldwide. And we won't give away any spoilers, but I think readers will enjoy how that plays out, how her mission plays out, and what her and and what she decides to do following that. Well, I just have two questions left, and one of them is kind of playful, I guess. But um, I noticed that like closer encounters where you explore the genetics and intelligence of the octopus. Also in Uberman, there is a focus on a, a form of marine life, which is the, gel, the jellyfish. And the way you describe the characteristics of the jellyfish, which were news to me, I didn't know this about, about jellyfish, how, how actually interesting they are. Um, it made me think about like biomimicry and robotics, maybe even wonder you know, could could the could the jellyfish be a, an advanced bioweapon, or could it be capable of like, storing digital information and in, you know in some kind of chemical matrix and that um, which can be downloaded into the human nervous system through the stingers through the like, neurotoxins? I don't know. Do you want to you want to say anything about about that and and about that image? Well, two things. First of all, yes, the description of the morphology and biology of the jellyfish and its relationship to the ocean is, uh, I think, going to be quite surprising for a lot of readers. Um, I get into how a jellyfish, which in some cases can be as large or larger than a blue whale, uh, actually have such an impact on the oceans that they're responsible for oceanic current movements. The dynamics of, of ocean currents and the weather patterns that they produce in some cases are being significantly impacted by the movement of jellyfish through the ocean, apparently. And so the idea is uh, that a form of life that's literally spineless and like doesn't even have a brain and, you know, what we think of as a central nervous system, that uh, form of life, which, you know, you would be inclined to believe is negligible, even as compared to other forms of ocean life, is having a massive occulted impact on the way the world works, okay, and can even produce storms, right? And this is a metaphor in the book uh, for the activities of an organization that 
I was involved with from 2016 through 2017, uh, an organization called Jellyfish, which was basically the salvaged intelligence directorate of Blackwater. And it had other precedents as well, for going back even further than Blackwater um, to an organization called uh, G3I, which was a, a Rome-based intelligence group uh, focused on offshore oil platforms. And by the way, people don't know this, but Blackwater, whatever they tell you their name means and why they chose it, really, it's a reference to oil in water. And so, you know, this G3I group uh, was focused on offshore oil platforms because I think they uh, provide a base of operations for uh, extraterritorial and let's say extrajudicial activities globally, okay? Um, and so anyway, these jellyfish people uh, were quite central to my involvement, both with the alt-right and with the Iranian Renaissance from 2016 to 2018. So I get into this, you know, at length in chapter two, of Uberman, and I think it's it's some autobiographical material uh, that readers will find particularly interesting, and that I'm revealing, you know, at length and in depth for the first time. Yeah, I agree. It's very intriguing reading, and I mean that in the sense of intrigue. But I also thought some of the stuff. Like the jellyfish have, um, how many eyes do some of them have? Like you were saying? I think it was like 24. And they can actually like peer up above water, like like a periscope. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and also, I mean, they, they're they potentially lethal. Yeah, kind of like what you were I forget how many times the, the force of a, a professional boxer's punch a jellyfish sting can have, depending on the type of jellyfish. Uh, but, you know, the idea is that you don't see them creeping up on you because many of them are, are largely transparent. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, you're surrounded by jellyfish and it delivers this thing that could either paralyze you or kill you. Uh, and again, I think that the organization that I was involved with chose this symbol for a variety of reasons, including some of these more menacing connotations uh, that come from the morphology and abilities of uh, that organism. Well, I think this would be a good uh, closing question. And it's like Faustian futurists, there are certain dimensions of the close encounter phenomenon are important in Uberman, particularly the subject of alien human hybrids, which you describe uh, these alien human hybrids are like beautiful anime looking beings and the hybrids that that I'm referring to here are would be like the offspring of this super organism that you know, like we share the planet with that is mutating humanity you know through this hybridization project um, and could even be where like the trickster archetype originates from in that it produces paranormal events and seems to show itself to human consciousness in this form, like people having, people reporting like on DMT, experiencing clowns and, you know, Terrence McKenna's self-transforming machine elves. It seems like this trickster archetype seems to be a, a way in which the super organism shows itself. And, um, and that is responsible for mutating humanity through this this program of alien human hybrids. Um, are these hybrids in, in Uberman, are they the Uber mention? Are they the, the Uberman? You know, I left it a little ambiguous. Uh, clearly, they have something to do with the Uberman. Um, but it's it's left ambiguous and and deliberately so. Uh, you know the superorganism that is um, the mother of these beings 
<coughs> and this kind of reading them through the agency of these uh, shape-shifting creatures that can appear as greys or as mantids or, you know, um, the, these beings are in an adversarial relationship with the Olympians, with these Nordic self-styled gods who want to reimpose tradition across the planet. And so from the perspective of these shapeshifters who are, who are like the, you know, octopus tentacles of the Prometheon, from their perspective, the hybrids could be the Ubermensch, the Ubermenschen, the, the race that will come after man, the new race, as it were. But ultimately, it's going to be up to us how we negotiate that evolutionary leap, right? It's not necessarily going to be the case that uh, what these shapeshifters envision as the morphology of the race that will supplant mere humanity uh, is necessarily going to be the shape that that new race takes. I mean, we're going to have some say in that. Uh, how much say we have in it depends on how many people can start thinking seriously about these questions before it's too late. And, you know, our, um, our margin, our, our scope of action is, is constrained, right? The, the longer we wait, before you know, grappling with these questions in a serious way and before having the resources to be able to develop a new society, the less we will be able to determine its shape as compared to uh, these shapeshifters and this higher intelligence that's also involved in the process of bringing this new race into being, right? So that's a kind of uh, convoluted answer, but. I'm not sure that more clarity than that is actually possible at this point. And, you know, uh, only over the course of time, I think, will it become clear um, what shape this new race will take. Uh, but I will, I will stick my neck out and say that how these hybrids are treated and what winds up happening to these people uh, will largely determine whether we're able to successfully navigate this evolutionary leap. I portray them in Uberman as hostages of a sort. And, you know, I think it's going to be paramount to find some way to protect them and to ensure that they are part of the future, whatever else that future looks like. And in conclusion, is there one thing that you would like future readers of this book to know going into it or some statement about it? You know, I probably shouldn't say this, but, but I will anyway. Okay, if you're going to ask me to identify one thing the reader should know. Uh, one thing they should know is that this book is going to activate their psychological defense mechanism. OK, this book, for the same reason as, you know, we were describing it earlier as a surrealist work, which ultimately required me to alter the filter between my conscious mind and subconscious while writing it. Uh, this book is challenging on a whole other level than my other uh, writings, even Faustian Futurist. I mean, Faustian Futurist is not an easy novel to stomach, but it's a novel. Right. I mean, it was put forth putatively as a work of fiction. Well, first of all, when you read Uberman, you're going to find out that a lot of Faustian Futurist wasn't fiction. Although, of course, one central question in my whole work is what is the relationship between fiction and reality? And how does folklore structure, you know, reality in the first place, which we discussed? Right? What's the relationship between truth and truth claims and the tapestry of meaning that, you know, the poets of a people uh, weave uh, before you can even have something like science? So. Faustian Futurist was, was uh, hard to stomach, right? It required a lot of what Nietzsche called intestinal fortitude to be able to really make it through that book. Um, but this is going to be challenging on a whole other level. And I, I would say the most important thing about Uberman is I think how you react to it is going to say a lot about who you are. And so in a way, 
this book is really the litmus test of whether someone has the ethos to be a part of the Promethean project that I am proposing. It quite deliberately aims to, you know, demolish certain binaries, like, for example, the public-private distinction, which are going to need to be transcended if we're to evolve beyond mere humanity into some new form of society that's more psychically integrated and more psychologically whole uh, so that we can, you know, navigate the perils of these various singularity level technologies. Things like the, the degree of uh, distinction between the private psyche and the public sphere that undergird our contemporary society are going to need to be re-examined and restructured. And so there are parts of this book where I'm deliberately violating the reader to force the reader to examine that boundary between the public and the private. There is a kind of unbearable intimacy in this book, and it is deliberate. Okay, People think I've just lost my mind and like he doesn't know what he's writing. Like, did he, does he realize what he wrote? Yes, I realize what I wrote. I'm doing it deliberately. Okay. Uh, and how you react to it is going to say a lot about, you know, whether you can get onto this arc that we're building, because the, the world that we're in is collapsing. And we're trying to build an arc that will take us to a new world, the new world that I alluded to at the end of Prometheus and Atlas, right? A new world, if we can take it, uh, if we can steal it. So, so yeah, um, let's see what you're made of. You know, this, this book will be telling in that regard. It pushes a lot of buttons, and it's like a field full of landmines as well. But also, the, the binary between life and death is deconstructed in this book because reincarnation plays a, a major is a major theme in it, and full knowledge of one's past lives and the relationships one has had with with others in their current life uh, is is a theme in this book too, which you know gets into. Uh, a lot of questions and, and, and issues. So, um, yeah, uh, well, wonderful, Jason. Thank you so much. And I really hope people go out and read this. I think it's going to blow their minds. And um, will there be a third one? Is this the second in a possible trilogy? There certainly could be. We'll have to see. You know, it depends on certain factors. Um, uh, We'll just have to see. Let me leave it at that. There certainly could be a third volume. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jason. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Always yes. great talking to you, Michael. You too. Thank you very much. Bye for now, my friend.